thank you for having me here. It's, uh, it's amazing to be here in Bermuda. And um, it was great to follow uh, Dr. Lambert's talk because you know, fundamentally, uh, we as people um, are often seen as uh, kind of always seeking a very fast reward. Um, but the, the thing that the Long Now Foundation got started with, and it, uh, it, it started back in now about 25 years ago almost, but really with a set of stories. And stories are the things that, that do persist over very long periods of time. And they're also where we kind of teach our society how to not, not necessarily always take the easiest path and to solve the harder problems. Um, the first story that, um, that I'll mention about this was a story that was first uh, told to me from Stuart Brand, who became one of the founders at Long Now. Uh, Stuart had founded the Whole Earth Catalog back in the 60s and been kind of hacking culture his whole life. And he told me the story of these beams at New College, Oxford. And New College was built in the 1200s. Uh, originally, it was the New College back then. And, um, but it had these huge oak beams over the main hall. And 500 years later, uh, they realized that these beams had become rotted and infested with beetles, and they had to replace these beams. And they didn't quite know what to do, because commercially you couldn't buy trees like this anymore in Europe by the, by the 1800s. And it wasn't until they spoke to the school forester who said, oh, well, we, we have the trees that you planted. And it turned out that when they built that, that hall, they also planted groves of trees to solve this kind of intractable problem in the future. In a way, they, kind of, they, were, they were good ancestors to their future selves um, that had to maintain this. And it was this kind of thinking that this group of people who, who started gathering around this idea of long-term thinking, people like Danny Hillis, who had been building some of the fastest supercomputers in the world uh, out of MIT, realized that um, we aren't really planting acorns right now uh, for the future. But if we are gonna solve problems such as climate change or education or hunger, clearly if we're only given a four-year horizon uh, to solve some, a problem like that, we are not going to even get started. So how can we actually stretch people's thinking about time? And Danny Hillis's thought was to build, uh, was to build a clock, a clock that, that had a time scale that truly stretched our imagination and, the, and, and was, was kind of at a scale uh, that we would hold in our minds and we would tell stories about, once again, stories being this kind of currency of the way that, that humans think over very long periods of time. And the first question really became, you know, what is our time scale? Should we, should we work in billions of years? It's kind of hard to imagine that feeling very relevant uh, to people. Um, or even millions of years at this geologic scale. It's still stretching kind of too far in a way. But this idea of the last 10,000 years being the, the human technological moment, the last ice age retreats, the first cities are created. In a way, some of our longest lasting institutions themselves are cities. Uh, and what can we learn from that? And, and if we use this time scale of 10,000 years, we're not just looking 10,000 years in the past in lengthening our now, we are also looking 10,000 years in the future. So if we imagine ourselves not at the end of a 10,000 year story, but in the middle of a 20,000 year story, how would we act different? What would we do? How would we be better ancestors to, uh, to our future selves? And so this idea then became how to build a 10,000 year clock. And I'm gonna show you um, some of the most recent work that we've done on this, but I also wanna kind of go through some of the, the historic examples of how things have lasted, as well as how we, um, we look at time kind of as a civilization. And um, one of the first projects I worked on was, was making this diagram. One of our other founding board members is Brian Eno, and he kind of talked about these ideas of, uh, of these layers of human time and the fastest ones on the outside and the successively slower ones going down to the slowest one, of course, being nature, kind of vatting last. And, and this is a diagram to kind of figure out, you know, how do you, um, how do you tease apart when somebody is not doing long-term thinking? And so you can imagine when uh, Maxam Corporation bought Pacific Lumber up there on this commercial scale uh, layer. And Pacific Lumber's main assets, of course, were old growth redwoods. And Maxam Corporation bought companies and sold them for their assets because they were worth more than the purchase price of that company. And so they started cutting down old growth redwoods and selling them. And so they kind of skipped all these parts of infrastructure and governance and culture. And then all of a sudden, those layers got very upset and intervened and started saving these trees. And so you can imagine how uh, using this diagram, you can kind of tease apart when long-term thinking is being done uh, correctly or incorrectly. Um, some other examples of uh, the way that, that things have lasted for a long time. 
uh, include uh, being lost and then being found at the right moment uh, by the right people. This is an x-ray of one of my favorite mechanisms in the world uh, called the Antikythera device, which was found at the bottom of the Mediterranean Ocean. It was 2,000 years old. Uh, it set back the, uh, the date uh, for many mechanisms uh, like uh, differential gearing as well as a lot of astronomical uh, uh, ideas in terms of how, how long we have had expertise in these things. But I think what's amazing about it is that it is, an, it is a mechanical object that was found in just tiny fragments um, and then it was reconstructed 2,000 years later. Um, and so we now have, we now know that it was an astronomical clock uh, that was coming across the Mediterranean from the, uh, the Arab world. And we've, we've reconstructed it, and it's, it's a fairly important concept. If we're gonna build something that's gonna last for 10,000 years, it may or may not survive completely intact. But if we were to make an electronic clock, or you know, if you found a laptop at the bottom of the Mediterranean that was 2,000 years old, you can imagine it would be a very difficult thing to reconstruct its intent. So using this idea of mechanics rather than uh, complex electronics. Or um, the other one is that in general cities, while city structure themselves are very stable over long periods of time, the stuff in them churns very fast. And so if you want something to last for a long time, making it remote enough um, can often be a good strategy. This is a picture of the, the seed vault in Svalbard that I visited a few years ago, uh, one of the most remote places on Earth. But I think what's also interesting about the safety factor of being remote is also the kind of uh, the storytelling and the mythic quality about it. Um, I was signing my name into this guest book here right after Ban Ki-moon and Jimmy Carter, and this idea, that this strange little seed vault that was designed to last a thousand years in the furthest reach of the Earth, um, it created this kind of mythic quality, the storytelling quality that we would hope that something like the Clock Project would do. You can also just take a really long time to build something um, to make it last, and the cathedrals in Europe are a very famous example of this. Um, this is the cathedral at Cologne, it took over 600 years to build. Um, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona is well on this path, it's 125 years into its design history and it's already a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is kind of amazing to think that it's a construction site that is a World Heritage Site. Um, it's not done yet, um, and it probably won't be for at least another 50 years. Um, in Japan, we have some of the greatest examples of maintenance in the world. Um, this is one of my favorites, uh, the, the temples at Ise that are rebuilt in alternating sites every 20 years. So something as, as ephemeral as thatch and wood rebuilt by a master, or the, the master is then handing that information down to the apprentice, um, keeping not only the knowledge, but the kind of the physical memory um, of how these things uh, can work, can also help to make something last. Communities of practice, really, you know, fundamentally, if we're gonna make a clock, it's gonna need to have some kind of maintenance, and we need these kind of communities of practice. And martial arts is, a, is one of my favorite ones. I think mean, yoga, there's all kinds of these other ones where it's not an organization that has lasted for thousands of years. It's really just this practice that is handed down, once again, kind of from master to apprentice. And the last one I'll mention, uh, again, this one comes from the natural world is one of my favorites. This is a bristlecone pine tree. This is one of the oldest continuously living species in the world. And it was actually postulated that it existed before, uh, before it was found. They, they realized that as they started dating uh, conifer trees, that the ones in the worst environments were living the longest. And so this idea of adversity breeds longevity was put out there. And they said, if you could find the, the conifer in the worst environment in the world, you will find the oldest one. And in fact, that's what happened and found these trees living over 5,000 years in the uh, California White Mountains. So a little bit just to kind of dive into the kind of design problems of actually building a 10,000 year clock, uh, once we have some of these ideas of inspiration for us, um, one of the things that the clock has, that like any clock, is it has a timekeeper. In our case, it's very similar to many timekeepers. It's a pendulum and it is keeping uh, absolute time. It ticks a little bit slower than most, and it has, uh, you know, it's made out of much more robust materials. But eventually, it's going to drift, and we needed something that would synchronize it to the sun on any sunny day. And this is a picture, uh, what's called the analemma, which is a picture of the sun uh, throughout the the year um, at high noon. It's particular ones at high high latitudes, so it's a high noon. Uh, you can tell it gets pretty close to the horizon, but. Um, What's interesting about this is that it's basically it's showing you the uh, non-normal orbit of the Earth around the sun, and, and this gives you this plus or minus 15 minute difference of, of, of solar noon. So our clock is keeping absolute time, but then we have this other part of the clock that peaks up at the top of a mountain that, uh, that focuses sunlight and gives us a trigger to say this is, absolute, this is solar noon. 
we can't uh, rectify the two without something that, that is a cam, for instance, that would have this equation in it. And there's spin clocks that have done that. But if you're trying to build a 10,000 year clock, you also have to keep track of the fact that the Earth is processing every 26,000 years. It's slowing its rotational rate by about a second a century. And all of those things then need to get put into a three-dimensional cam that turns around once per year, but you read it over the course of the life of the clock. And in our case, we actually added a little bit more time so you'd have time to make a new one. You have about a millennium to make your next cam um, at the top of this. But it goes, the fake cam follower goes up at once in 10,000 years uh, and gives you that difference of, of solar time to absolute time. And in a way, this one object um, is an embodiment of the difference of solar and absolute time for 12,000 years. I mentioned that we're working in monument scale. We started with uh, prototypes, and the first prototype is at the Science Museum in London now, but now we're working in full scale, which is this kind of uh, experience design where we are, have a site in West Texas. Um, we're, we're building it underground, another good technique for things to last for a very long time. Um, we wanted people to kind of enter into this uh, experience by hiking up a trail, having traveled this far distance, um, talked about the experience that they might have. They go through the underground experience. They come out the top of the mountain uh, after seeing the clock and kind of where it now is clearly a much more man-made structure and are, and are put out back at the top of the mountain and hopefully change the way they think about time. And um, the problem is, is that the techniques that are generally used for underground uh, construction right now are things like uh, blasting, which we did some of, but fundamentally we, need to create, we wanted to create structures that allowed people to walk through the clock and feel as though they were part of the clock. Um, and we were, we, there was techniques that really just didn't exist, um, but we did see that in uh, places like Carrara, Italy, they are cutting these uh, underground spaces like we wanted to cut, but we wanted to do much more kind of organic shapes. Um, they were creating these just to take the marble out. So they had developed these, um, these saws. And uh, in this case, it's a nine foot uh, diamond belt saw. Um, but what we did is we put a three articulations on it in a robotic environment and built a 36,000 pound robot that we then operated for two years, 24 hours a day underground. And uh, as you make each cut, we could break away the pieces in between and what it left us with was 250 vertical feet of stairs where the staircase is tapering the entire way where every single cut was different um, and created this kind of amazing set of stairs around the clock itself. And that brings us to the clock itself, which uh, we've been working on now for 20 years, this particular part of the project since 2005, but literally just uh, in the last year started installing parts of this underground. It is not complete yet, um, but I'm gonna show you um, some of the work that was, that was just completed. This is a, a rendering of what we wanted to do, uh, this thing called the chime generator. As I mentioned, Brian Eno is one of our other founding board members, a musician, and he and Danny Hillis uh, worked to make an algorithm that could ring a series of 10 bells in a different sequence each day for 10,000 years. So a mechanical computer uh, that could generate three and a half million permutations of bell ringing so that every person's uh, time with the clock kind of became their own. Um, and just last June, we, uh, we installed this. This is the largest uh, mechanism of the clock and the heaviest uh, 60,000 pound mechanical computer with 10 bells on it. Um, and then it's uh, fixed into the walls with actually with no fasteners, only with pins that create friction up against the walls. Um, and the materials of the clock are, are things like uh, stainless steel and uh, titanium. So a lot of long lasting alloys, in some cases silicon bronze, like the bells themselves. Um, and then probably one of the most uh, important parts of the clock, the materials that we used, were the bearings themselves. You can imagine uh, something lasting for thousands of years, and we have in, in examples in museums of even paper and leather and wood, things lasting for thousands of years. But to make something that has working parts that last for thousands of years was a real trick. And uh, when I started on this project 20 years ago, I found the exact thing that I wanted to use, which was a ceramic bearing. They were developed for satellites um, that could operate in space with no lubrication. And it wasn't uh, until, and at that time, those, when I started looking at them, they were, they were only available in a few sizes, and they cost $50,000 each and were really difficult to, to order. But now they're in fidget spinners and uh, rollerblades, and they cost $5 each. So we just really hit that 
particular product development curve uh, very well. And now the entire clock has ceramic bearings and no lubrication whatsoever. So it, it uh, and the ceramic also does this great job of isolating two different uh, types of metals from each other so you don't get what's called galvanic corrosion. And I'll close here just to tell you, you know, all of this is, you know, it's a big engineering project. We do other projects like bringing, trying to bring extinct species back with genetic engineering and, and talking series around long-term thinking uh, uh, at the Long Now Foundation. But really all of it is to inspire you all to figure out, you know, what is the thing in your own life, if you're a policymaker, what is the policy that you could create that creates optionality for the future rather than closing, it, closing out options for the future? What is the thing in your family and the, your generational planning to your children and your grandchildren that creates optionality for them? Fundamentally, the, fu the people of the future know much more about their present than we should be able to predict about our future. And so hopefully you can all think of the ways to scatter the acorns that will grow up to solve an intractable problem for your future. Thank you. <laughs>